Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Activity-Based Protein Profiling for Drug Discovery. Over the next hour, our panelists will discuss how proteins, and enzymes in particular, play a pivotal role in human physiological and pathological processes. They'll explore how activity-based protein profiling, or ABPP, methods exploit the power of chemistry to elucidate enzyme activities and identify novel therapeutic targets. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. Dr. Matt Boijo is a professor of pathology at Stanford Medical School. His interests are focused on the use of chemistry to study the role of proteases in human disease, in particular in tumor genesis and the life cycle of pathogens. Dr. Ben Cravat is the Gilula Chair of Chemical Biology and Professor in the Department of Chemistry at the Scripps Research Institute. His research group develops and applies chemical proteomic technologies for protein and drug discovery on a global scale and has particular interest in studying biochemical pathways in the nervous system and cancer. Ben is also a co-founder of several biotech companies. And also today, our session will be moderated by Dr. Brad Bacchus. He is an associate professor at the UCSF School of Medicine and began his career in the pharmaceutical industry, spending nearly 10 years with Novartis and Abbott Laboratories. Brad is also the co-founder of Pliant Therapeutics and has contributed founding intellectual property to several other biotech companies. Before I turn this over to Brad, I do want to remind all of the attendees that you can uh, post questions during the webinar using this Q&A panel in your Zoom toolbar. We will reserve an hour at the end uh, to uh, pose questions to the panelists. All right, Brad, over to you. Well, welcome all, and thanks to CDD for hosting this event, and thank to, thank to uh, all of you for joining. Activity-based protein profiling is a collection of methods and technology. It's had a profound impact on both basic research and drug discovery and development. Whereas genomic strategies and proteomic approaches are often limited in that they can only depict protein abundance in a sample, activity-based protein profiling can characterize protein activity, that is members of a particular proteome that are actually turned on that are free of endogenous inhibitors. The advantage that this affords for understanding proteins uh, and their relevance in some biology or disease state is obvious. Now at a high level, the cartoon you see here depicts a typical approach. You have a complex proteome and a spe specific member of this proteome or a particular class of targets is targeted with a reactive activity site probe uh, that allows for visualization like, like a dye is attached or enrichment like a biotin is attached. Now following labeling, proteins can be visualized by in-gel fluorescent uh, scanning or after enrichment, downstream LCMS analysis can be performed to tell you what's in your sample. <clears throat> now, ABPP probes have been developed for numerous different enzyme classes, including hydrolases, metalloproteases, oxoreductases, glutathione S transferases and, and many more. And these technologies have been expanded broadly. Uh, today, we're really lucky to have both Matt and Ben with us, two scientists who pioneered this technology way back in the 90s and who have really led its innovation to its maturation today uh, and all the pow powerful tools that we have at our disposal. Now, we're gonna start out by, start out by asking about the genesis of these technologies in their labs and how these evolved to uh, durable applications that we're familiar with. So Matt, maybe I can hand it to you. Uh, yeah. to tell us about the genesis. Yeah, Brad, thanks a lot. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today and CDD for putting together this webinar. I think it's a, a fun topic for, for me in particular. Um, and I, I really wanna say I'm particularly excited to be here with, with Ben Cravat, who I really think of as a, a close friend and colleague who um, I've known now over 20 years. Um, I think our relationship and interactions have been a great example of how you can work in a field and sort of synergize 
with one another rather than sort of competing in a specific field. I mean, I, I often would get asked about who are my competitors when I was first starting out in this field, and I, I would kind of scratch my head and think, well, the, mo the closest person is really Ben, and he's, he's, he's a great friend and collaborator, so I don't think of it as competition at all. Um, so that kind of brings us to the beginning of this, and actually I met first met Ben um, in the late 90s uh, when he was basically a, a young assistant professor at Scripps, and I was um, just getting my lab started at UCSF as a faculty fellow there. And he came through um, and he had just published his paper on um, his FP-based probes that you see here on the right in the slide. And the reason why he had synthesized these probes was to study a single enzyme called Fa, fatty acid amide hydrolase. And he gave this amazing talk um, at UCSF. And this is probably one of the first times I had, you know, I was in the seminar circuit where the, the speakers would come and talk. And so he came into my office and luckily was on my schedule. And we had this amazing conversation um, and, and realized that we had very similar interests. On the left, you see is what I was working on actually as a graduate student, even before I started at UCSF, um, was, was making these kinds of covalent labels of the proteasome. Um, when I was a, a graduate student in Hitta Plus lab, we were very interested in sort of understanding how that multi-component protease complex worked. And it, there were just a number of things you couldn't do with classical substrates, which is what people use to study proteases. Um, because there are all these different active sites, if you throw a substrate at it, you didn't know who was cleaving it, which subunit. Um, and so I first synthesized this compound that you see here, which was a vinyl sulfone. And back in the day, we used radioactive labels when it was uh, still in vogue to use iodine 125 uh, and slop that stuff around the lab. Um, and I remember distinctly, I tell the story as like one of the aha moments for me as a graduate student was the gel image you see there in the middle labeled auto radiogram. I had added, I had added the, the probe on the left, you can see the silver stain, to the total protein or to the total cellular extract. And then when I was pulling this film out, I thought the experiment didn't work because it was blank, 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 blank. And then all of a sudden, boom, you saw those bands that you see there. And it, to me, it was amazing that I could label uh, a single subunit in that case of a multi-protease complex in the context of the entire proteome. And it looked just as if it was a purified protein, which is what you see in those two lanes. And then you see a 2D gel image of that. So it, it sort of opened up the door for me, this idea that like we really need to use these kinds of covalent labels as a way to, to track enzymes sort of in real time. Um, and that, that really sort of was the direction I took. Um, and I know Ben followed along that track as well. Um, if you advance to the next slide, maybe, Charlie. Um, I think I have another really kind of old slide in here. Yeah, this is great. This is from paper from back in 2002 um, when we started playing around further and going after other targets. So moving from the proteasome, we started working on cathepsins as targets. Um, and those are a relatively small family, but highly related protease, uh, proteases. And, and we had started with a slightly different type of electrophile here. You can see the epoxide-based electrophile, which is based on a natural product called E64. And this slide is just the purpose of showing you this was that we've, we soon realized that there are all these different modalities for detecting these probes once they're bound. Um, and obviously we had done work with I-125, but that was suboptimal. Um, it gave a very sensitive signal, but there was not much you could do with that. Um, biotin was another one. Obviously we could use that to pull out targets, but the real step forward, um, and I think Ben and I both started kind of doing this around the same time was putting a fluorophore onto the molecule. And then we realized um, that if we had a flatbed scanner um, or some way of scanning the gel for fluorescence, we could see the bands. And uh, the funny part was back then, there weren't really good commercial flatbed scanners for fluorophores. Um, and so the top image A was actually taken using a DNA sequencing setup um, where I basically labeled individual purified cathepsins with different colored probes and then uh, ran those protein samples through the very thin DNA type gels on, on the machine. And the machine was looking for fluorescence and that's how it read out um, the DNA fragments. And so we could actually get a protein gel like image, which you see there. So that for us was like, wow, this is really the direction we need to go. And then, and then eventually uh, commercially you could get flatbed scanners, which were a lot easier. You could just take your gel and not even remove it from the glass. You could literally put your gel down onto the scanner scan and get the kind of images you see at the bottom. And it was nice because it showed you could get very specific labeling here. These are, these are labeling of four cathepsin targets in the context of a whole cell. Um, and you can see labeled with all the different strategies. So that, um, that was kind of the, the early days of activity-based profiling. And I think you know, where Ben and I diverged a bit was that I always had this interest in hydrolytic enzymes, so proteases, hydrolases, esterases, um, you know, enzymes that add water across a bond. 
Uh, and Ben, I think, you know, made the, the really uh, sort of brilliant leap towards just broadening the reactivity and broadening the classes of enzymes that you could see with this. And as you know, he's now moved even into further into sort of reactivity profiling. So um, yeah, that's kind of my, my two cents about the history of, of the field. And I'll, I'll, I'll let, um, you know, Ben add some stuff to you here. Thanks, Matt. It's, uh, it's also great to, to be with you here today. It's been really fun to reflect on the last, you know, 20 plus years or more time working together in, in this emerging field. And um, I think as you, as you alluded to and pointed out, it, it is important to note, I think, to the audience that these sorts of technologies, you know, really emerged from specific problems that both you and I were trying to address in our, in our um, biological systems of interest, whether it be understanding proteasome subunit function or cathepsin activity, or in our case, the specific functionalities of hydrolases involved in endocannabinoid metabolism. And, um, you know, I've always adhered to the belief that, that if you can solve a specific problem in your lab with a new technology or approach, oftentimes it will generalize, right? And, and, but the converse can be challenging, right? If you start with the divine concept of trying to create a general technology and you don't have a specific problem to work on, I think it can be very difficult to know um, where to apply that technology. And so uh, I, I think in large part, the, the, to the extent that activity profiling has had this, this much broader impact across the field, I think it's because it originated with very specific problems that we were trying to solve. And those problems end up being problems that many of the labs are trying to solve on their specific proteins of interest as well. And um, the, as we'll talk about a little bit later, you know, the generalized tools that emerged proved versatile, not only for our specific proteins or enzymes of interest, but for, in, in some cases, entire several hundred member of protein families. So, um, so yeah, so I'll, that's all I'll add right now, but, but I, maybe I'll let you kind of e explain how you've taken this into really remarkable areas of imaging, and then we can return to the broader, you know, chemical proteomic approaches that our labs yeah. take after that, so. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for us, the genesis was that, you know, once we started to realize these things could be labeled with fluorescent tags, we, we wanted to ask the question, could you go into more complex systems, obviously not just cellular systems, but whole organisms. Um, and that's sort of the direction that my lab has taken, certainly since I started at Stanford back in 2003. I think on the next slide, we have some images. Yeah, so this just shows some of the exact same probes that we were working back in the early 2000s on cathepsins turned out to be very good for labeling tumors. It turns out cathepsins are very highly expressed uh, in the tumor microenvironment. And this just shows where we've injected uh, a mouse with one of our activatable fluorescent probes. So I would say that that was another big step forward for us was realizing that if we could make them fluorescent, we could also make them activatable fluorescent. Um, so we came up with this concept of quenched activity-based probes where um, now as the probe covalently labels the target, it actually releases a floor uh, a quencher for the fluorophore, and so you get a signal. And this allows you to now do very rapid imaging because you don't have to wait for the for the unbound probe to circulate out of the system. Um, and we've been over the last now uh, oh, almost 20 years. That's coming up on 20 years. We've been playing around with this in in vivo systems. I'm happy to report that actually one of our probes is now entering or entered into clinical trials in Australia. Uh, in patients with lung cancer and is starting a clinical study in the United States sometime later this year. So it's really exciting to actually see this kind of data that you're seeing here in a mouse, but actually in a human patient. Um, and I think it's an exciting time for um, contrast agents like this for imaging. And I think they're going to have a, a very big impact. I'm guessing in the next three to five years, you're going to be seeing most types of tumor surgeries involving a contrast agent where it allows the, the surgeon to be able to see where the cancer is. You can see here on the left. Yeah, go ahead. That's really exciting, Matt, that it's going into humans. Do they do, they do this as an ex vivo application or actually uh, uh, use this uh, directly on the patient? It's actually uh, systemically administered, yeah. So th that's been the hurdle for these kinds of agents getting to the clinic is that um, it has to go through kind of the same kind of regulatory steps that uh, a drug would, um, and it, that took some effort. Um, but now there's a number of companies that have contrast agents that have been through phase two, and now some one just went through phase three and has been approved. Um, so that's exciting, uh, and that that's this is an area that we've been really excited about um, pursuing. And you can see here, sort of on the left, like this is the problem during cancer surgery. You can see the tumor is fluorescent; it's very large. But the on the right in the yellow region, that's the actual tumor bed. If you just look at that in the white light, you'd think, oh, we got all the tumor. But when you see the fluorescence and do the pathology, you realize we left quite a bit of cancer cell behind. Um, and so this is what we're, we're gunning for um, and, and 
we've been spending a lot of time trying to make our probes more selective, basically, which is kind of interesting because it's kind of the opposite of Ben making things more broad so you can profile more on a proteomic sense. We've been, we really want selectivity because we don't want to hit, you know, targets that aren't present outside the tumor. Um, and so that's, that's again, where I think we've diverged and, and in, in a very good way. <laughs> um, it's allowed us to sort of broaden the field for sure. I think there's one more slide that just shows, um, if you just go to the next one, yeah, that just shows again, like these kinds of probes, how selective they can be in vivo. I mean, this this is akin to the moment of seeing that gel coming out of the processor where there's a single band there. Here, it was like, here's a whole animal. This is one of the mice um, injected with our cathepsin activatable probe. And you can see these are the mammary fat pad tumors, the two of them. And you see some other signal elsewhere, including the lymph nodes, but it's really, really a bright signal specifically in the, in the tumors. Um, and so, yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun ride along that path with uh, probes. And you know, another area we've really been interested in is using them as a way to um, identify new protease, in particular new protease targets. Um, if we have a system where we know a protease is involved, we don't know what it is. If we have a, a compound that's a covalent inhibitor of that activity, we can then use that as a probe form to pull out the target and identify it. So we've done a lot of that kind of functional biological studies uh, where we have a specific phenotype. That's really interesting. I, I think that <clears throat> between the two of you, you know, between targeting specific enzyme and broad classes, uh, it's very complementary. Ben, do you want to talk more about uh, broad yeah. uh, coverage of, of proteome classes? Sure. Maybe go to the next slide, I think, um, as a template. Yeah. So, um, you know, when Matt and I were beginning these efforts, it happened to coincide with when genome sequences began to appear in their complete form. And so that got protein scientists quite interested in initially just kind of cataloging to the extent that we could at that time, you know, memberships in different large protein families, say in the human genome or, or your genome of, of, of choice. Um, and then that, that's where it became clear that at least for some of the activity probes that were already being developed, such as those targeting the hydrolases shown here, um, there was an incredible membership of, of that type of protein family in humans, two to 300 enzymes of which many of them remain, well, most of them remain certainly without selective inhibitors and even a substantial fraction remained unannotated as relates to their endogenous functions, you know, substrates and products. And so I do think that one of the more um, durable applications of activity profiling, especially with a probe like this fluorophosphonate, which can react with hundreds of members of a given enzyme family, um, it allows one to have a universal assay, so to speak, to look at changes in the activity state of those proteins and then pretty much any biological system of interest. And then, as we'll discuss in a moment, also allow you to use it as a tool to discover inhibitors for, for those proteins. And so, um, you know, in that regard, you know, I don't think we, I think we necessarily saw, foresaw that, that broad application until the, the scope of the, of, of the proteome was appreciated. Um, but I think that, that once it was recognized that there was such a large fraction of unannotated proteins, um, and, uh, and these probes had such broad reactivity with, with memberships of large families that, that, that then it became pretty clear how one could apply them. And then I think, you know, what we also learned during that time was, or gained benefit from, I should say, is advances in mass spectrometry based technologies, right? So if you go to the next slide, you know, we began to ask some simple questions like, you know, why do we need to restrict ourselves to pockets of enzyme active sites for, for chemical reactivity analysis? If the mass spec can read out tens of thousands of peptides, maybe we could push this technology to look at the reactivity and functionality of say just amino acids in the proteome that are intrinsically nucleophilic like cysteines, right? And that's led to this hybrid activity slash reactivity based prof profiling concept. Um, this is some recent work published in the last couple of years where what's neat is when you start applying that type of approach to look at the ligandability, if you will, not to mention the reactivity and functionality of cysteines across the broader proteome, you can begin to get the evidence of how many sites of small molecule engagement there exist in the proteome that are far outside what you might call classically druggable space, i.e. outside the active sites of, of enzymes, right? So this is sort of a, an example, you, know, you take a compound library and add it to a biological system, right? And if one of those compounds happens to interact with a site that, a, that an activity probe reacts with, they, they compete with one another. And you can read that out in a variety of formats. You know, if you're looking at obviously 10,000 or 20,000 sites in parallel, it's going to be a mass spectrometry based readout. If you have a more selective probe, as Matt's described, you can look at it by imaging, you can look at it by gel-based analysis in, in, in very convenient formats. And I think this has ended up being a pretty valuable and versatile application of activity profiling because it puts the sort of uh, 
chemistry discovery part very far in front of the biological investigations. You know, we've actually have examples in our lab where we've discovered you know, useful tool compounds for proteins and enzymes where the initially the only known bio, biological activity is the probe reacts is, is the protein reacts to an activity probe, right? <laughs> and then then you can use that 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 selective tool compound that's been discovered in this way to annotate the, the functions of the proteins in, in in rather complex biological systems. And so so I think, you know, one of the general learnings from, from this type of ass strategy is, you know, not only can we expand, like, I would say, like, the, the tool set of, of, of selective chemical probes within druggable space, we actually, I think, realize, at least with covalent chemistry, that one can radically expand the ligandable or druggable space outside of conventional druggable act, active sites. So, um, yeah, this is just to, 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 to point out that, like Matt mentioned with his imaging tools, there are now multiple drug candidates in clinical development that I think from the very moment they were discovered as hits, used activity profiling as a guiding tool to optimize their specificity. These are actually both covalent inhibitors that are, are remarkably selective there for their respective um, hydrolytic enzymes, FAW and maglipase respectively. Um, and I think that these covalent inhibitors, you know, end up being potentially highly useful drugs in part because they do have such specificity for their targets. And I'm not sure that type of information could have been acquired for an enzyme family that's got two or 300 members without this type of chemical proteomic strategy underpinning the evaluation of, of, of compounds that, that, that were discovered, um, you know, uh, maybe by more conventional screening methods and then optimized using activity profiling as a guiding, guiding tool. So Ben, you yeah. know, when I began, uh, you know, covalent inhibitors were taboo, uh, yeah. maybe like 20 years ago. And what impact do you think uh, ABPP has had on changing people's perceptions of COVID. Yeah, I'll, give, yeah, I'll, I'll give, a, give a couple of thoughts on that and certainly would be interested in Matt's perspective as well. But I think you are correct, Brad, that probably both Matt and I kind of got laughed at maybe 15 years ago when we would propose purpose, purposefully or intentionally developing covalent chemical probes, if not drugs for, for proteins, because it was just thought that they would be, you know, um, indiscriminate labelers of proteins throughout the proteome and you couldn't harness and control their, their reactivity. Um, but I think activity profiling as well as, as I think some, um, you know, ambitious efforts in oncology initially around covalent kinase inhibitors and the willingness to bring those into the clinic, um, has, I think, uh, flipped that narrative or that's that, that completely. And I think now you'll see many companies, I think that would, would prefer a covalent inhibitor if they, or a covalent ligand, if they could develop one assuming that it, it, it can achieve the level of potency and selectivity of, of a drug candidate because you can start separating out pharmacodynamic from pharmacokinetic effects, especially for proteins that have reasonably long half-lives. And that can allow you to, in some ways, get away with, with, with a, a, a compounds that are less perfect on the pharmacokinetic side in exchange for, for, for benefiting from you know, living off the half-life of the protein for your pharmacological activity. Um, and of course, it also allows you to find pockets in proteins that are, hit, that are pretty challenging to drug in a reversible way, I think. Kayvon just wrote a really nice review about the perspective on this, comparing G12C KRAS inhibitors versus the emerging efforts to go after uh, other G12 variants of, of, of or mutant variants of KRAS that now use reversible ligands. And the challenges are very different, right, in terms of what you can get away with with a more shallow or difficult drug pocket if covalency can be used as a as a as a way to to, to harness that 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 um, interaction. So you know, I, I I think yeah, your question, I guess, getting back to it is is would that maybe phrased another way, you know, would the enthusiasm for covalent drug development be where it's, it is today without activity profiling and chemical proteomics as an underpinning technology? And I actually think it probably wouldn't be because I think there would have been drugs that would have been taken forward that would have failed in the clinic for gross toxicity. And, you know, and in fact, there's one FAW inhibitor that fell in that category, right? That wasn't really vetted by chemical proteomics in an aggressive and, and intense way. And that compound you know, ended up having very severe side effects that have nothing to do with FAW, right? Many FAW inhibitors have gone in and it, if anything, you know, FAW inhibitors are, are too safe <laughs> in some ways from a clinical development perspective in, in their historical activity. So I, I do think that that maybe if, if chemical proteomics wasn't around to support the optimization of those types of compounds, there would be more examples of that type of failure of covalent chemistry from a, a safety perspective. And, and that in turn may have, may have um, sort of reinforced the traditional biases against this type of modality. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I mean, for me, it's, it was a, a, a very real experience because when I was at UCSF as a fellow, after I left there, I moved to Solera Genomics for a few years um, and did actual, some, I was involved in several of their drug discovery programs, including some of their 
cathepsin inhibitors that were partnered with Merck. Um, but I remember distinctly at the time, like if we had any kind of meetings, uh, my group was really responsible for trying to develop these kind of covalent active site probes as a way to sort of look at target engagement of their lead molecules. But if, if I ever talked about any of our molecules, they would always have to be called tool compounds or, or probes, but never like a drug lead. Um, and ironically, um, at the time, Solera was moving into the kinase space and they wanted probes specifically to look at kinase targets. And this was back in early 2000, 2001, I think. Um, so my, my group at the time made, um, you know, took, took some of the, uh, took a known kinase inhibitor and added electrophilic uh, warheads onto it. And in fact, one of those compounds, which was a tool compound, as it was called at Solera, ended up getting sold off and became imbrutinib. It was purchased by Pharmacyclics. Um, and eventually was the molecule that now is, I think, one of the, the, the key molecules that pushed the, the sort of momentum towards covalent drugs. Um, and, and, you know, we saw that when we were at Solera, when you had a compound that was a covalent compound, you know, it made your life way easier. You didn't care so much about the pharmacokinetic profiles. You cared about um, how much, what was the Cmax, how much drug got in, and then um, how much target got engaged. So it became a pharmacodynamic analysis. And that was also much easier to do, um, to be able to figure out how much target did you hit, where did you hit it. Um, and so it became clear that this was a, you know, a, a good strategy. It just, I think it took a while getting over the hump that this, this idea that if you have a covalent modifier, you're going to induce an immune response. And, and certainly there are um, examples of that. Um, so anyway, I think it's been fun to watch. And uh, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's, it's been a nice transition towards covalent um, type drugs. And I think we're going to see a continued expansion of that into the, the pharmaceutical space. Yeah, I actually think, Matt, following up on that, that the, you know, the G12C ligands are a particular case of interest in my mind, because they're, to my knowledge, arguably the first example of, of a covalent drug that was not repurposed from a reversible ligand, right? That, that was designed with, you know, with sort of a chemistry, a covalent chemistry first approach from the beginning, right? Purposeful, right? Like if the covalent kinase inhibitors largely were retroactively modified reversible inhibitors, um, so you, so one could if one wanted to be a cynic or a skeptic, one could say, oh yeah, well you know that's uh, a, a low bar, right, to be able to take a tight binding reversible inhibitor and then retrofit it with a covalent, war, you know, electrophile to, to 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 achieve your outcomes. But but I think the GTLC ligands from Amgen and and and, and Marathi and Wellspring and others. Are, are a different example, right? And if and if that can be generalized, I think that that really bears um, some thought about how how broadly that could be applicable across the proteome for breaking down traditional boundaries of drug ability. Yeah, definitely good conversation on that. I think uh, maybe maybe we could switch gears just a little bit and ask each of you, you know, is there a particular direction? that this technology is heading or needs to head or particular direction that you're excited about at this time? Um, sure, I mean, I can start quickly. I, I mean, I think one of the things that I'm excited to, to see is that because it's become more um, sort of in vogue to work with covalent modifiers, you see the expansion in the space, in the chemistry space of the electrophilic sort of warheads and traps that are being used now. There's just a nice paper that came out sort of profiling the reactivity of all these different electrophiles and then um, sort of doing the deep proteomics to ask what gets modified, how selective are they? What? Because that's a big question, you know, how much, how much reactivity do you want in a warhead? And I've always talked about this, you know, for me, the vinyl cell film was my first sort of electrophile that I really got excited about. And that molecule, you know, when you talk about regular vinyl sulfones with like an alkyl vinyl sulfone, that'll react with a free thiol, no problem, right? It's a Michael acceptor. But it turns out if you put it in the context of these peptide scaffolds, so you have an alpha nitrogen, that becomes very deactivated. Um, and what I was really thought was cool was that here's a molecule that um, really just does not react with free thiols unless you heat it at very high concentrations. Um, but then you put it into the cell and boom, it, it forms this covalent bond. And, and it was even more interesting to me because it hit the proteasome. I remember, you know, the first molecule that I started with was a peptide aldehyde um, called MG132. It was a leucine, leucine, leucine aldehyde, which was one of the only published or known inhibitors of the proteasome at the time, other than lactocystin, which was a natural product. Um, and I saw that and said, well, that's one step, um, the Horner-Wadsworth-Emmons reaction away from a vinyl sulfone. So let's make the vinyl sulfone version to see if it works. And all my chemist friends were like, oh, that's stupid. You know, that's, that's a Michael acceptor. Michael acceptors react with thiols, not with hydroxyls. And sure enough, I made it and 
tested it and it reacted. So here you have an example of a Michael acceptor type reaction with a hydroxyl um, nucleophile. So it tells you like the reactivity, it really depends a lot on how well you can get things to bind, right? And, and what where you get close to that nucleophile. So, you know, I think it's gonna take some calibration to understand, you know, what is it we're looking for? And, and I think it also depends on what scaffold you're gonna put that electrophile on. If your scaffold is something very small, like a peptide or even smaller, like a drug, like, you know, less than 500 molecular weight molecule, you're gonna need a lot more reactivity out of your electrophile, which is gonna potentially give you cross reactivity with other targets. As you get to bigger molecules, you probably can get away with much, much less reactive electrophiles. Uh, the problem there is then you get things that don't look as drug-like and maybe don't get into cells. And so it, I think this is the exciting part of the field is we're starting to see expansion of the type of electrophiles people are reporting on, uh, more testing of those. And I think in the future, we'll have a better sort of, um, I would guess, menu of potential things to, to build into probes. Definitely. I think, you know, the ability to target different residues as you said, to move beyond cysteines, uh, definitely opens a lot of doors. How about you, Ben? Yeah, um, those are great comments by Matt, and I, I certainly su support those areas as well. But I, I, I may highlight a, a slightly complementary one, which is, you know, as we've begun to get outside the active sites of, of enzymes, and you're finding high quality druggable pockets, you know, these are fundamentally binding first assays, right? And so we are then sort of uh, encumbered with the opportunity or challenge, depending on your perspective of relating those binding interactions to function. And um, we begun to uncover and publish work on, you know, some really remarkable allosteric sites that are being discovered uh, through this type of binding first approach, um, even as well as sites that are at the interface of RNA, DNA binding with proteins and such. And so it, it, it really then starts to raise some provocative questions about, um, you know, how, what, what the fraction of these druggable pockets are that are agonistic, antagonistic, silent, contextually silent, contextually active against the, their proteins of interest. And how do those events then relate to say the genetic loss of function of that protein, right? And, and, and I, to me, you know, to the, and I have this, you know, maybe ridiculous, but interesting vision of, a provocative vision of, of, of ligand discovery and maybe 10 years out from now where, you know, these sorts of um, allosteric and non-active site-based ligand events will provide much more contextualized ways to regulate protein function than just a sledgehammer or a complete deletion of a protein genetically, maybe even in the context of, you know, proteoform specific ligand ability, right, where you can start not only drugging, you know, a kinase, but drugging a kinase in its phosphorylated state or its protein protein interaction state again to get re more refined you know could there be a day when chemistry is more refined than genetics in terms of its ability to manipulate and mod and, and and control protein function in cells i think that would be you know quite exciting and then finally i'll mention that you know i think as as, as our lab certainly probably one of the most liberal in terms of, of of using the terminology activity profiling across a whole variety of chemical proteomic approaches um and so one could argue you know if you're finding allosteric sites in the proteome of drug ability that have reactive cysteines in them are you just finding sort of neo-functional outcomes that are pharmacological or are you sort of rediscovering sites in the proteome that the cell is naturally using through its own endogenous small molecule electrophilic or otherwise repertoire to regulate protein function in other words all these allosteric sites also themselves activity reflective and i think in many cases they probably are it's just a challenge for us to deduce you know, what the endogenous regulators are, right? I, I, I look back at something like, and, you know, Brad, you'll be familiar with this, right? The, um, the amazing work out of GNF many, many years ago to discover the merisolation pocket as being a druggable site in BCR ABLE, right? Or ABLE specifically. Um, that's a good example, right? Of a druggable pocket that, that actually is in a site of endogenous regulation outside the active site of the kinase itself. And I suspect there's a lot of that going on and maybe chemical proteomics can help find these pockets first with synthetic ligands, right? then allowing the biological community to go back and figure out what the endogenous ligand might be. And then, you know, ultimately maybe this concept of activity versus reactivity profiling just kind of goes away, right? And any side of drug ability in the proteome may end up being a, 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 potentially a way of, a, that the cell regulates function of proteins a, as well. That's terrific. The uh, targeting of allosteric sites is certainly a, an amazing vista to, uh, to address. Uh, Charlie, did you want to head to uh, your uh, your uh, uh, quiz for the the uh, group? Yeah, hi, thanks. So uh, we're going to launch a poll here.
um, and we would like to give the attendees a chance um, to vote here um, on what you think is most relevant for ABPP. Um, I'm not going to read the choices here. Hopefully you can read these and uh, make your choices appropriately. And they're off to the races, everyone. I see the, the scores coming in. People are still voting, so we'll give them a, a few more seconds to, to wrap all of this up. All right, everyone, I'm going to end the poll in three, two, one, now. Thank you very much. So here are the results. If you guys can all see this, so the 38% of the attendees feel that drug discovery leads uh, is the most relevant, but followed very closely by target validation. So maybe not a, a clear winner. If you guys have any comments on those. I think this is what I would hope to see, right? They can do all that, <laughs> right? <laughs> if there's a clear winner, that means the others aren't as interesting. So yeah, I think exactly. it's really good that it's distributed. <laughs> it's credit. <laughs> Excellent. All right, guys, I'm going to stop sharing this. And uh, uh, Ben, back to you. Or Brad. Yeah. Whomever. <laughs> How about we, uh, you know, we've had a really uh, terrific conversation here. Uh, we have a good amount of time for questions, and I noticed there are a number of questions. Uh, can we move to uh, questions, Charlie? Yeah, absolutely. So we will uh, turn that part over to Abe to see which questions we had coming in from the attendees. Abe, all yours. Okay, hey, thank you. Charlie. I'll read a few questions from our audience. Um, the first one is, can you use covalent reversible warheads to make an ABPT, or do you need an irreversible one? Yeah, I think that it, I, I think you can certainly profile covalent reversible or even reversible ligands for that matter for their interactions with proteins by competitive pro activity profiling. But I don't think that those reversible uh, electrophiles will be stable to many of the, not all, but, but many of the applications of activity profiling, which you know, would involve uh, steps to denature proteins and they might fall off. If there's ways to, uh, maybe Matt can comment on that from an imaging perspective, maybe there's ways to use them in a manner that doesn't require denaturation and then you're probably okay, right? But I think a step that they will fall off if once proteins are, are denatured, if that's part of the protocols. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's what Ben says is absolutely correct. But um, in, in the case of like for proteases, there are, there are definitely warheads that have slow enough off rates that allow you to see them. I mean, I think that, that it's challenging to get them to stay on under denaturing SDS page conditions, but um, we, we think they're, they're useful from the perspective of imaging um, as long as the molecules stay, stay bound long enough for their contrast to be generated. Um, and, and there are definitely ones like that. Boronate's a great example, right? It reacts with hydroxyls, but some of these boronates have off rates of like 24 hours or longer, which is essentially like a covalent molecule. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you can do it. You just have to figure out what your applications are and then understand the on-off rates of your molecules. Good question too. I always wondered about on-off rates, for instance, for uh, say lead discovery. You know, are there situations where you're missing things because the you know, the lignin is moving in and out and the uh, covalent uh, warhead has an opportunity to sneak in there. Yeah. It looks, like, it looks like Dan, Dan Erlinson, who, who we, we know, <laughs> put in a question into the panel, into the chat, which he wasn't supposed to, but I'll, I'll ask, I'll read his question. <laughs> um, he asks, like, there are all these warheads being explored. Um, he's asking whether, based on our experience, there are ones that you would definitely avoid. Um, that's an interesting question. I think it depends on the applications. I mean, someone to keep an eye on is uh, near London, who's at the Weizmann, who's been doing a lot of fragment-based stuff. And, and that, it's been fun chatting with him about this because he's looking at covalent fragments. Um, and, you know, when you ask him about it, there are certain warheads that just, depending on how big your fragments are, will work or won't work. Uh, I think that there are warheads that are going to be just too reactive, um, but that could be used in the context of fragment screening, for example, and then could be detuned a bit. Um, and so I think that it, it, there aren't any warheads that I would say you absolutely avoid. It can't be used at any cost, but because he even uses chloracetamides and other things that are quite reactive, um, but he kind of needs that to be able to get the initial binding of a very small fragment. Um, yeah, I like what you said, Matt. It depends on the, the experiment of interest, right? If it's looking for a ligandable pocket, if it's doing a cell-based experiment, or if you want to make a drug, right? And there, those are different requirements for the quality of the electrophile and its stability and such. But you know, I think it's also important to point out that even with the same electrophile, you're beginning to see 
some guidelines emerging, not from, I think, academic labs as much, but from the drug discovery industry about how to attune the, the stab stability of those electrophiles, right? So if you look at the G12CK RAS inhibitors or some of the covalent kinase inhibitors, many of those are just, you know, wrote acryl acrylamides, but you start looking at how they're modified as they become optimized drugs, and you'll start seeing that if it's a you know, a papyridine or a papyrazine acrylamide, you'll start seeing these little magic methyl groups decorated around the papyrazine or the papyridine ring. And that's almost certainly to mitigate GST mediated metabolism of those, of those drugs. So as we get a better SAR of, of the main routes of metabolism, that can be used uh, as a way to optimize uh, compounds from tools to drugs that improve their, their half-lives, right? So, because ultimately if you have a, if you have, you're not, you know, covalent drugs aren't gonna have an advantage for short half-life proteins unless you can keep the drugs around, right? So if you have a target, that's one of the perplexing aspects of the, of, of, of the, of the breadth of the approach, right? If you wanna extend this to targets that can't be drugged without covalent chemistry, right? Cause they don't have a, whatever, a, a pocket that's amenable to reversible chemistry as easily, but they also have a short half-life. That's gonna require your, your, your covalent ligand to have a, a PK properties that resemble a reversible drug. And I, and I think the industry is starting to do a really good job of figuring out how to make that happen and make that work. So. Um, so I wouldn't even say that all, all electrophiles are, uh, even the same electrophile isn't created equally in the different scaffolds that may be found in, right, in terms of, of, of it, its uh, durability. Well, here's another question that popped up here. Can post-translational modif uh, modifications affect reactivity? Yeah, we just, I mean, yeah, we just published a paper on this, uh, initial forays in this area, right, looking at... Uh, how phosphorylation events across the proteome can impact proximal cysteine reactivity events. And it's pretty interesting. You can see phosphorylation events that will stimulate or increase, I should say, the reactivity of, of cysteines on a protein and those that will decrease. So this gets back to the comment I made earlier about whether one might eventually be able to create proteoform restricted covalent ligands that take advantage of, um, uh, for instance, a phosphorylation or a PTM's effects on, um, on the reactivity of a protein. Right. And I think it's very early days, right? That paper was, was, was just the first foray into trying to understand this, but I think the data are encouraging and certainly warrant further investigation um, into considering how the different ways um, that proteins are modified in cells can impact their, um, their reactivity with small molecules. Here's another question. Uh, what's your take on targeting protein-protein interactions? So it's certainly always a, a very difficult uh, challenge. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I mean, my lab's starting to work a little on that um, as we've developed some of these kind of phage display technologies to kind of get at more um, complex ligands that are used, like in this case, cyclic peptides or bicyclic peptides that contain the reactive electrophile piece. Um, we're starting to look at those kind of interactions because I think they do require these greater protein-like interfaces to be disrupted. I think the idea of using covalent and something that has the ability to bind almost like a small protein um, has real potential for disrupting those things. It's been traditionally very challenging, but adding the, the covalent piece to it, I think could really help a lot. Uh, I don't know, Ben, what do you think? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, we have had, we've had some pretty good luck actually with protein, protein mod, mod, modulation. Again, with, as Matt pointed out, the, the caveat or the, not the caveat, but the context that the, the ligand recognition event is probably going to be dictated by not a fragment in that case, but more of a elaborated small molecule that has SP3 kind of character to it to allow it to interact with protein protein interfaces that may be a bit flatter than a, and, and less shaped as a pocket than say the an, an HP binding pocket of a kinase. But um, no, I'm a, I'm a big believer that the appropriately designed covalence libraries can, can certainly have a big impact on, on modulating protein protein interactions. Here's another question from a uh... Uh, Pat Fitzgerald, who says, can you comment on the state of ABPP in the context of antibacterial drug discovery? He notes that both of you have published in the area recently. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, no, that's definitely a big area for us. We're really interested in infectious disease, um, not only for the drug development side of it, but also for the imaging side. We think this is a, a big hole right now for, you talk to infectious disease doctors and the problem is they can tell you you have an infection through a blood culture, but they don't know where it is, um, nor do they know how it's responding to treatment. So we're, we've been developing and using profiling with actually a lot of Benz probes shifting over towards the fluorophosphonates because of their broader reactivity than a lot of our probes. And we've identified all sorts of interesting, both serine proteases and serine hydrolases um, for bacterial targets 
we're looking in the gut commensals now, and I've identified really interesting targets there as well. So I think, um, yeah, there's real potential here. I believe that, you know, ABPP could sort of help to better characterize a lot of these poorly characterized bacterial genomes in particular. Um, and then once those are characterized, there's the potential to throw whatever molecules are, are out, out there at it. And I think, you know, these numbers of like, for example, even just serine reactive molecules that Ben's worked on and Abide Therapeutics, which is now Lundbeck has, um, I think those all could be basically used against these targets. So I think for antibiotics, it would be quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, one of the areas, Matt, that I think is underexplored with activity profiling, but is, be, but is just beginning to emerge as a thematic area of interest. Um, again, always drawing to you know, think about where can chemical biology be, solve problems that genetics has had trouble with. Some of these bacteria, if you like tuberculosis, they, ha they have like, you know, many replicate members of a given subclamp, right? And so as a genetic analysis, single gene knockouts don't reveal any evidence of functional functionality for those paralogous, paralogous enzymes because they can all compensate for one another. But if you can create a tailored polypharmacology chemical probe through activity profiling, those might become the most relevant drugs, right? Where now all of a sudden four members of a related clan are being drugged collectively in a way that, you know, the genetic experiments would have told you each individual enzyme is irrelevant, but all four inhibited together become lethal to the, to the growth of the bacteria. And certainly in enzymes like TB, that's the case, right? Where they just have this massive expansion of like hydrolytic enzymes. And I suspect that several of them are performing overlapping and complementary functions so that a single genetic knockout is not sufficient to re, re, to record the relevance to the organism's you know growth and viability yeah that, that brings up that's a great point Ben because I mean we've we've been working with some of these kind of um, well one was the natural product in in plasmodium falciparum which is the causative agent of malaria and there we uncovered a whole host of um, serine hydrolases that we think are lipid processing enzymes, and you have to hit multiple of them to really kill the parasite. But what's more interesting about that is it becomes very hard for the parasite to become resistant when yeah. you hit multiple targets. So we're finding very low resistance in the That's bacteria, which is really cool. The other thing that we're finding is if you take a drug like for the proteasome and you have a reversible binder against the malaria proteasome and an irreversible binder, the, the reversible binder tends to lead to induction of a resistance phenomena in the, in, the, in the parasite, whereas the irreversible one doesn't. And we think it's because what happens is you can make mutations around the binding site of the molecule so, you're, so you don't bind quite as well. And that has a big impact for a reversible binder. Yeah, yeah. You can't mutate the nucleophile or the enzyme's dead, yeah, right? Right. So, so all, that totally all, makes even, sense. even if it's slower over time, you're still yep. accumulating dead enzyme. So uh, we think it's really cool from a perspective like that for infectious disease. Yeah. The participant asks, uh, how about the application of these technologies to GPCR is certainly a, a large uh, drug class. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I do think that there are, I mean, there are some GP GPCR drugs in the market that actually adventitiously work through disulfide bonding to, to, to those rare cysteines that exist on the outside of cells in a free form. But one has to re re be sober about that, right? And recognize that, you know, GPCR sequences tend to be, have a lot of sequence outside the cell or within the membrane. And this may be where one needs to consider alternative amino acids beyond cysteine, right? Because most of the cysteines, not all of them, but most of the cysteines outside the cell are disulfide bonded pretty stably, right? Which would make them inert to electrophilic interactions with small molecules. So, you know, I don't think that there's been a lot of progress in this area yet, but over time, one can imagine as the um, electrophilic chemistries for additional nucleophilic amino acids begin to mature, um, there might be opportunities in, for covalent chemistry in the GPCR space more purposefully than, than those that have been discovered so far. Yeah, I honestly believe if you, get, if you get the right electrophiles and you have enough diversity of fairly complex ligands attached, um, there's really no limit to what you could go after. Um, you know, there are limits to where those molecules can get to if they're very big and uh, they require so much binding energy to, to deliver the electrophile. But I think uh, there's there is definitely the potential to go after non-catalytic and not even very nucleophilic residues uh, if you can get your molecules to bind in the right spot. Um, Another question, maybe targeted towards Matt. Uh, uh, participant asks, how challenging is it to find and apply appropriate warheads with phage display? Maybe a little bit more yeah. detail on the phage display methods. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're kind of playing around with now. I mean, we, we've tested some of our known warheads that, we've wor that we know work with like proteolytic targets. That, that was our first paper. And now we're looking at uh, electrophiles that 
we um, can attach and we're going for the much more deactivated electric vials because they're we think that the the phage approach allows you to get to these sort of billions of complex sequences so now you can sort of make up for the low reactivity of the electric vial with higher binding affinity um, so it's just something i think you have to you have to test um, and we're in the sort of early days of that great maybe uh down to our last questions uh Another participant asked for more detail on the prospects or just the, the future of non-cysteine nucleophile targeting, uh, maybe more on the chemistry there. Yeah, I mean, I think that that um, there's prospects there, but one, again, has to be a little bit sober about recognizing cysteine's intrinsic nucleophilicity at neutral pH is, is dialed for covalent reactivity. And the reason that there's so many covalent drug candidates and drugs for serine hydrolases is that's also what happens with the catalytic nucleophile in a serine, right? It gets, it gets driven from a PK of 14 or 15 down to seven or eight, and it's also hypernucleophilic in, in the context of neutral pH. I think when you think about other amino acids like lysine or tyrosine, I think you have two choices, right? Uh, one, which is less attractive to me, is to just play in the sandbox of the very small subset of those residues that also happen to have for whatever reason, um, perturbed PKAs to fall within the range of hypernucleophilicity at neutral pH. That's going to be a small sandbox, in my view, based on the data we've already generated in our lab and others. There aren't, there aren't that many lysines and tyrosines that are PKA perturbed in the proteome. The more uh, attractive approach, and I think Matt was getting to this earlier, would be to, to strike a slightly better balance of recognition and reactivity, right? That if one can improve on the reversible binding elements of a small molecule, um, such that the small molecule has is, is got a high effective molarity in proximity to an otherwise very attenuated nucleophilic residue like a PKA unperturbed lysine, I think you have a chance to get covalent chemistry to work to your advantage in that context um, because you'll be able to have the effective molarity drive the reaction even on a residue that is less overall nucleophilic um, and, and do so with a less reactive electrophile. But um, those these are early days still, and I think that's something that we're going to have to um, work through in a case-by-case -case basis, right? Because that, that puts a lot of demands on the reversible binding affinity of the initial ligands that are used as templates for covalent chemistry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're coming up against the hour. I, I'll take this uh, time to thank Ben and Matt for the stimulating uh, discussion. And thanks to all the participants for all the questions. Uh, I'll hand it back to Charlie for uh, final comments. Yeah, thank you, Brad and Matt and Ben for this discussion today. Uh, as a reminder, I would like to uh, let you know that Collaborative Drug Discovery's CDD Vault platform offers a comprehensive solution for the storage management and analysis of chemical and biological data. If you're interested in more information, you can always navigate to our website, collaborativedrug.com. Or if you're interested in finding us in the real world, we're back out there um, participating in these upcoming conferences. And finally, we'd like to announce that the next webinar that CDD will be hosting uh, is the COVID Moonshot Collaboration uh, webinar on June 9th, where we'll have scientists from the COVID Moonshot Project discuss their ongoing collaborations to address the global pandemic. So thank you very much again to our panelists and moderator and to all of you attendees for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.